Sean Don has experience with diverse data sets. He's a quantitative ecologist. Um, he did his PhD at Arizona State University, studied food web interactions along riparian upland gradients. And from there, he transitioned to the marine realm using his experience in R to land a position analyzing global patterns in marine megafauna bycatch. So I hope a couple of students are all here today. I'm sure there'll be a few make some stories when we get back. Um, <laughs> that led to a second postdoc focused on West Coast fisheries and protected species affected by them. So I don't know if you all know that we have a, uh, for instance, a time area closure off the coast here. It's a rather large polygon that extends from about Point Sur up to about two-thirds the length of the Oregon coast and all the way out to the end of the EEZ. It's a time area closure for leatherback turtles, uh, whereby the drift gill net fishery is not able to fish in that area between August 15th and November 15th. And so some of the work Sean Don has been doing is to, to look at uh, patterns or behavior patterns uh, by the fisheries relative to oceanographic features and such, and how we might be able to tease apart any overlap between those fisheries and leatherback turtles to make that time area closure more dynamic instead of something that's static and provide some opportunities for fishers in there. He went on to do, uh, he went on, he then worked on developing a life cycle model for winter run Chinook salmon in the Central Valley. And he's just recently started a permanent position with the Conservation Science Division of the National Audubon Society in San Francisco. So again, uh, experience in diverse data sets as a quantitative ecologist. He's very well published. Uh, and uh, please welcome John Dunn. Thank you all for inviting me and uh, for showing up. Um, so, before I get started, uh, if I ever slip up and say I, I mean we, and by we, there's quite a few of us. Most of the work I'll be talking about here was done while I was at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in San Diego, along with Tomo, Susie, and Heidi, um, looking at the, the drift gillnet fishery and the behavior of the fishing vessels themselves. And again, now we're trying to extend that to include overlap with the sea turtles. So just to give you a brief outline, I'm going to talk about three sort of distinct projects, but they're fairly related in one way or the other. So first, I'll be talking about boosted regression trees and fisher, fishing effort prediction. And this is something that we just completed. This was the work that I did while I was down in San Diego. And next, I'll touch on briefly BRTs and bycatch species distributions, specifically leatherbacks, and how that can be used to assess overlap with fisheries. And then finally, since I'm now with Audubon, uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about other extensions of using boosted regression trees. And this isn't even my own work, but I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work my colleagues did right before I got there on using boosted regression trees to predict grassland bird species distribution shifts as a result of climate change. So really the goal of this talk is, is kind of twofold. It's certainly to talk about bycatch and using um, you know, different analytical methods to try and reduce bycatch interactions. It's also to spend a little time talking about boosted regression trees, and I won't go into the gory math or anything, uh, really just because I feel like they're a very useful method for doing a lot of things, especially in the ecological realm, because they avoid a lot of the assumptions that go along with other parametric statistical tools, things like um, general, generalized linear models, generalized additive models, anytime you're trying to make predictions. Okay, so to start off, I'll talk about this project, Modeling Fishing Effort to Mitigate Fisheries Bycatch. And this was work I did again with Tomo, Iguchi, Susie Cohen, and Heidi Duar at Southwest Fisheries in San Diego. So you probably don't need this reminder, but uh, just to put in some background, fisheries bycatch is just the incidental capture of unwanted species and or size classes during fishing. And it can have really dire conservation implications particularly when we're talking about marine megafauna. Things like sharks, seabirds, sea turtles, marine mammals that tend to have that K-selected life history strategy where they have you know, long-lived adults and slow reproductive out, uh, life cycles. So there, with bycatch, there is no silver bullet solution. There's different mitigation strategies that have been employed for different species and in different regions. 
Um, one of the examples of a mitigation effort is gear modification. And here we see the fairly uh, well-known turtle excluder device. And what it is is it's something that's installed in shrimp trawls. And it's basically a little shunt that pushes large things like sea turtles out of the net while the smaller things like the shrimp pass right through and into the cod end of the trawl. Uh, another example of mitigation strategy is cha are changes in fishing practices. And um, probably the most famous example of bycatch are the dolphins in the, the uh, tuna purse seine fishery in the South Pacific. And here, you know, the fishery used to be catching literally thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dolphins a year. And by simply changing the way that they closed the nets on the tuna, they were able to reduce that bycatch down to, to like one one hundredth of what it used to be. And finally, perhaps the most commonly used approach has to do with fisheries closures. And these closures can be temporal in that just, you know, certain areas are closed for certain periods of time, or they can be strictly spatial in that certain areas just allow any sort of fishing whatsoever. You can think of a marine reserve in this regard. So my focus in this talk today, or this part of the talk, is again going to be on these, these kind of fisheries closures. Now, in developing a fisheries closure, we can talk about what the circumstances would be like in an ideal world. Well, here we'd have 100% observer coverage, which would lead to high quality data on bycatch as well as on fishing effort. You'd know where the vessels were fishing and where the bycatch interactions were. And this would allow us to, um, you know, predict or to assess where the problem areas are. On top of that, in an ideal world, these fishing patterns and the distributions of the bycatch species wouldn't change over time. So they'd be fairly static. And if that's the case, then what happened last year is likely to happen next year. And you can base your planning of the reserve or your um, spatial fisheries closure on that. So you can identify these bycatch hotspots and sort of, uh, you know, avoid fishing in those areas and thereby reduce bycatch. And um, an example of something that can be applied to this sort of thing is this paper that uh, I did along with Rebecca Lewison and Janet Franklin, and in which we mapped bycatch patterns across the seascape. And we looked at this for both for multiple species and multiple spatial scales, just to sort of see what the bycatch patterns were like. And we did this both with, we did this for longline fisheries both in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And here what you see is longitude on the x-axis, latitude on the y. All the fishing sets are in black. The ones that had a bycatch encounter are in red. Same here. And if you use spatial statistics, I won't go into the details here, on this sort of thing, you can identify where these hotspots are. In this case, there was a hotspot right here. And you can say, okay, well, if these patterns don't change over time, then this is an area where we can avoid fishing and reduce bycatch. Of course, in the real world, we don't have those sorts of situations very often. <coughs> the observer data are usually quite limited, so we don't have as much information to go on. And the fishing patterns and bycatch species themselves are quite dynamic. Uh, as you all know, working in the oceans, systems are dynamic. You know, species are often following features, oceanographic features, rather than static uh, patterns in the landscape or in the seascape. And so how do we deal with this? Well, when observer data are limited, one way to, to uh, assess bycatch is to use qualitative approaches. And an example of this was done by my colleague Jeff Moore, where they actually used port-based interviews of fishers to find out, and this was done in, um, in developing countries where there's basically no monitoring whatsoever. So this is just kind of a, was a first cut attempt to see what the fishers are catching and what the relative magnitude of that bycatch is. So this is, this is great, but it requires actually visiting the countries, going out to the ports, so having people boots on the ground. And so it's, it's far more efficient in the sense that, you know, a few interviewees can collect a lot of data, but you still have to have a lot of, overcome a lot of logistical, logistical challenges there. And you're relying on the fishers to remember accurately what they caught five, six months ago, and to report it honestly. So this is good, but it's got certain disadvantages. Um, another approach to dealing with uh, just a lack of observer data is to estimate co-occurrence of bycatch species 
as well as the fishing effort. So for an example of this, uh, I draw on this paper by Goldworthy and Page, which was published in 2007, and it's looking at overlap between the foraging of Australian sea lions and the demersal gillnet fishery. And I'm just using this, they actually looked at several species and several fisheries, but just for simplicity, we'll focus on these two. And so here what they did is they said, okay, well, these sea lions are resident, residents in this area, so they're not migrating around. They're pretty localized, and so we can identify where the foraging is concentrated. And the same with this uh, demersal gillnet fishery. It's uh, you know bottom set gillnets. They're not following oceanographic features. They're going to static features that are, that are familiar to them. So this is a great example of where you can look at overlap just using static maps and then assess, okay, well this is where the probability of interactions are highest. This is where we need to focus our, our um, mitigation efforts. This works out well, but it only works in those situations where things are static. And in reality, bycatch species distributions are rarely not static. I say bycatch species fishing data. Oh, I, I dropped the knot off there. Um, and the same with fishing effort. Uh, you know, fishers are going to go where the fish are. And if the fish are moving around, so are the fishers. And so these patterns are going to be dynamic. This leads us to species distribution modeling, which has been applied to a lot of different areas of ecological research. And it's already being used for predicting the future distribution abundance of marine megafauna, but this hasn't really been done for fishing effort yet. Of course, it could be just as well done for fishing effort. You're just predicting the distribution of, of the fishing vessels themselves rather than the species that they're after. So the objectives of this particular part of the study or to examine the potential for modeling fishing effort using two distinct fisheries data sets. And these are the West Coast Drift Gillnet Fishery, which as Scott mentioned already, is known to interact with the leatherback sea turtles off the coast here, and the North Pacific Albacore Troll Fishery. And this one doesn't actually have very high bycatch, but we had the data and we thought it'd be good to examine two different fisheries just to see how well the, the um, methods work on, on distinct fisheries, because they are quite distinct. And so we ask four specific questions of the data. One, how well can statistical models predict fishing effort? So the, the whole premise here is if we're going to use these, then they have, to, they have to work fairly well. You know, I mean, oftentimes, especially when you're a grad student, you know, you get a, you get a R squared of 0.3 and you're like, all right, what a significant relationship. And that's great, but for actually predicting or, or telling somebody, no, you can't fish there, you need to, you need to have slightly stronger relationships in order to, to basically you know, make changes and, and ask people not to do things. The second question we asked was, okay, this is all well and good, but we can't do this retrospectively. We can't predict what the fishing effort would have been in the past using the data from the past. We need to know what's what it's gonna be like in the future because that's how management works, right? You can't manage retroactively. You can't say, oh, you shouldn't have gone there last week. You have to tell them where they can't fish next month or six months down the line. And so we asked the question, how well can the models predict spatiotemporal patterns in future fishing effort? Now, how do we do this? Well, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't see into the future. But what we did is what we, we basically used data from the past to predict present fishing effort. So it was kind of like a, basically we shifted the window back. So we said, okay, let's assume that we're in the present. We know what the fishing effort is, but we only have data from six months ago. So that would be as if we were in the present now when we're trying to predict fishing effort six months from now. Same idea. So we use that to predict the, the future fishing effort in a sense. Third, we asked, how does the length of the fishing effort time series affect model performance? And we asked this question because in reality, oftentimes these time series aren't very long. And so, you know, are there constraints? Does it have to be a minimum, do you have to have a minimum number of years in, in order to be able to make accurate predictions? And then finally, we asked this question of how important are temporally static versus dynamic predictor variables? So by static predictor variables, I mean things like latitude, longitude, bathymetry, things that don't change over time. If these things are very important, then you don't need distribution modeling. You can just do that more simplified overlap approach that I talked about, because things aren't going to change from one year to the next. But if dynamic variables like sea surface temperature or El Nino os southern oscillation, things like that, if those are important, then these species distribution models are going to be really useful because they're going to help you 
predict what things are going to be like in a changing environment. So the data for this come from uh, log books for the West Coast Drift Gillnet Fishery from 1981 to 2001. So we had a 20-year span there. And these data describe the total number of sets by month in 10-minute boxes off the U.S. West Coast. And for the North Pacific Albacore Troll logbooks, these went back farther in time, but um, because there aren't a lot of satellite data far going farther back in time, and because we wanted to make them of comparable length, we restricted it to the window 1991 to 2010. And these data effort is described slightly differently. It's the number of days spent fishing by month in one degree blocks on the North Pacific. So this is a, a picture of the, the two fisheries. This is just total effort over the 20 year time span. You see the effort for the DGN fishery is really concentrated in the south off San Diego here. But it does come well up here. It's still a fair amount of effort. Um, but it's, you know, it's very coastally oriented fisher here, fishery here. People go out in their small boats, set the nets overnight, get the catch, come back in the next day. The albacore troll fishery is a very different fishery. You see here, uh, there's concentrations kind of in this band around 40 degrees. But it stretches all the way out to you know, Hawaii. So these, these boats are out there for a long period of time. And uh, you know, they're, they're not restricted by the same, uh, the same factors that, that the drift gillnet fishery is. And what were the predictive variables that we had available to model? Well, for the static predictive variables, we used latitude and longitude, the distance to the coast, nearest port, the distance to the nearest port, and the mean depth. We only use nearest port for the drift gillnet fishery because the albacore troll fishery, they'll actually offload boats at sea, offload their catch at sea sometimes, so they're not restricted by that having to come back to port. Uh, for the dynamic variables, we looked at year, month, Pacific decadal oscillation, northern oscillation index, which is really a measure of El Nino activity, but for the <coughs> northern hemisphere, sea surface temperature, sea surface height, sea surface height variability, primary productivity, chlorophyll levels, and the north, south, east, west components of the current, as well as overall current strength, which is eddy kinetic energy. OK, so this is a lot of different types of data. And it presents us with a lot of challenges that uh, would be hard to overcome if you tried to use, let's say, a generalized linear model. First off, there's a lot of missing data. Whenever you're dealing with satellite-derived um, variables, you're going to have missing data. In our case, it was missing in part because the satellites just weren't up at the time. But even when the satellites are up, if we were just dealing on the present, you have cloud cover and you have other issues that just prevent you from having data all the time. Well, with a, a general, a regular statistical method, any uh, basically predictor variable that doesn't have all that data, you either have to drop the predictor or you have to drop the rows of data that have missing data. So in one way or the other, you're going to be losing a lot of information if you try to do this analysis with a standard statistical approach. We didn't want to lose that information, but how do you deal with that? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Another problem is that the data really do not meet the assumptions of standard parametric statistical, statistical inference, you know, the normality, homogeneity of variance, things like that that have been beaten into your minds over, over years of biometry. There are also a lot of predictor variables. You know, this is close to 20 variables here. It's hard to put that into a, a linear regression and it assess all of the interactions and such. And also to worry about collinearity, right? Some of these variables are related to each other. Well, if they're related to each other, that presents a problem when you're dealing in the, the standard, with the standard statistical method. As I mentioned, that you also have interactions between these predictive variables. If you tried to measure 20 variables, plus all the two, three, four-way interactions that are possible between them, you'd end up with hundreds of predictors in your model, which is just overwhelming. And then finally, we have nonlinear relationships between the predictive variables and the response variables. So this, you know, GLMs aren't so good for. You could do a, a generalized additive model to do this. But again, the generalized additive models can't necessarily deal with all these problems. So how do we, what, are, what methods are available here? Well, a method that's really useful for, it's a non-parametric method for dealing with these types of data is called regression trees. And they have a lot of advantages. Regression trees can handle missing data, 
They can also, there's also no need to transform the data. It, they don't make those assumptions about the, the way the data are, are um, organized and so on. You can uh, identify important predictors from a large set of input variables. This is nice. You can just kind of throw everything at it and the regression tree will tell you what's significant and what's not useful just won't get used in the model. Collinearity is not a problem either and they easily handle interactions between variables as well as nonlinear relationships between predictor and response variables. Regression trees are also fairly intuitive. I'll, talk, I'll show you this example in a second. And they can allow for model selection by cross-validation. Now cross-validation is where you actually use independent data, but basically you're using the, the data set to evaluate itself. Um, that gives you kind of a better idea of, of how the model's performing. So the idea is like you leave some of the data out when you fit the model, then you fit the model to those data, and then you redo this with different parts of the data set. That way you're actually using the entire data set and developing your model, but when you're actually calibrating it and testing to see how well it's performing, you are, are doing that with data that wasn't used to build the model. So this is a more honest way of saying, okay, you know, my, my predictive ability is, is this than, than actually overfitting with a, a standard model. There are a couple of disadvantages to regression trees, however. They don't have very good predictive ability. They're very good at visualizing data and sort of telling you what variables are important, which ones aren't, but they're not very good at predicting. And finally, it can be hard to interpret when the trees get very large. This is a very large tree, but you can imagine with all the variables we had and all the data that we have, we've got literally hundreds of thousands of rows of data, these trees can get quite large. So just to describe it for a second, basically what the tree is doing, it's called a machine learning algorithm. And what that means is that it's basically just letting the data tell it where, where to, which variables are important for organizing the data into more homogeneous groups. So imagine here that this is like X1 is latitude, X2 is longitude, and we have fishing effort. Well, what this is telling us is, is this first split, T1, which is occurring right here, is splitting up the effort so that uh, you have you see that there's generally much lower effort at lower longitude, greater effort at higher longitude. The next split is here at T2, and it's splitting up the effort at the lower longitudes into effort at, at high latitudes versus effort at low latitudes. And so what you're doing is you're just basically saying, you know, the predictor variable in, these, in this kind of variable space is more similar than it is to the predictor variable in the other areas. So you're just kind of dividing the area up. And it's easy to visualize in two dimensions. Of course, you can't really visualize it in three or four dimensions, but the method can handle many, many variables. Okay, so it's, it's great in many ways. It's got some shortcomings. Fortunately, we have boosted regression trees, which overcome the limitations of regression trees. And they overcome these limitations by using multiple trees rather than a single tree, and by adding stochasticity. So by adding a little bit of variability, believe it or not, your predictive ability improves tremendously. So what are they? And what do you do when you build a boosted regression tree? Well, what you do is you basically grow multiple trees sequentially. Each tree is limited in size. You say my tree can have up to five splits, let's say. And each tree is built using a subset of the data. You don't use the entire data set. You might use 50% of the data, data set or something to build the tree. And this is where the stochasticity, come, stochasticity comes in. You're not using all the data for each step. And what happens is you, predict, you build a tree on the subset of the data and you assess you know, where the tree is working well and where it's not working well. Then each tree builds on the results of the previous tree and the effort is focused on observations that are modeled poorly by the previous trees. And this is where that term boosting comes in. You're basically boosting the predictive ability of the, your model by focusing on those areas that the model isn't working very well. So to put this into more statistical terms, the final boosted regression tree model can be understood as an additive regression model in which individual terms are simple trees that have been fitted in a forward stage-wise fashion. Okay, so now that I introduced these, what did we do with these boosted regression trees? Well, we fit these BRTs models to the full data set. And this was first just to assess how well we can predict fishing effort. So remember that first question that we asked. For the second question, we used predictive variables from the past month to 
predict current fishing effort. So as I mentioned, you know, we were trying to say, what would the situation be like predicting into the future? For the third question, we fit the trees, the shorter time series of data. So we predict, we, we said, okay, what's, what would it be like if we only had three years of data, or four years, or five years? How well would the model perform then? So we actually fit the trees to those data sets and, and saw how well they were performing. And then finally, for the fourth question, we compared the variable importance scores, which is sort of a, a way of, of telling you which variables are important in the model, for the static versus the dynamic variables, for both the drift gill net fishery and for the albacore troll fishery, to, to assess basically, okay, well, how important is uh, uh, you know, having a, a sort of a predictive modeling approach for avoiding bycatch in these fisheries? Okay, so let's get to some results. So the first thing that you get out when you run a boosted regression tree are these variable importance rankings. And you'll see we threw a lot of variables in there, but it turns out not a lot of them are very important. Not too surprising. And so here along the, um, here we have the different uh, predictor variables. This is the scores. These always sum to 100. So you don't want to put too much into like, oh, well, you can't compare like start year here with sea surface temperature there in terms of importance. You compare within a, a particular data set. But what you'll notice here, there's one variable I didn't mention to you, Rn. This is a random number. So we threw a random number into our data set. For each row, there was a random number between 1 and 100. And we modeled that as a predictor along with all these other things. Now, why would we have done that? Can anyone have any idea? Yeah? It was a random number because they have to also put into account the outcomes of the variables and how well they perform. Yeah, exactly. So there are no p-values associated with these predictors here. So you need some way of assessing whether they're actually performing well or not. So if you throw that random number in there, that gives you kind of a gauge. Okay, anything underneath this random number is really not telling me very much. It's, it's still, it still might help a little bit, but it's not helping very much. So really the ones that are, are, are useful for these two fisheries are these variables above it. And these variables are not identical for the two fisheries, as you would expect, given the fact that they're very different fisheries. The next thing you can get out of these are called partial dependence plots. And what this is, this is basically visualizing the effect of a variable on the response, holding all other variables sort of at their average value. So it's trying to isolate the effect of each variable independently. So if we look at the drift gill net here, going down in, a, in importance, variable importance rankings, the first most important uh, variable was year. And this captures, I've smoothed these a little bit, but this captures sort of the declining fishing effort over time as this fisheries basically has, has diminished. Uh, the next variable of importance here is longitude. And here you see that fishing effort peaks at lower longitudes, which makes sense. Remember, the fishing effort was concentrated close to the coast off of San Diego, which is around here. Same thing with latitude. The fishing effort peaks at low latitudes. So the nice thing is, and this is of course always a good check, is you can look at these patterns and see if they make sense with your understanding of what you're studying. So in this case, these sorts of variables align with what we know about the fishery. Same thing with month and so on. I won't go into all the details of every variable. If we look at the albacore troll fishery, um, the set of predictors, again, show interesting patterns that align with what we know. So here, the most important one is a dynamic variable, and that's sea surface temperature. And we know that, the, that their target species, the albacore, like temperatures between 10 and 20 degrees C. Well, gee, that's where the fishes are as well. Not too surprising. But it's good to see that the model is at least telling us what we know is the case. The big question is, how well are these models performing? You know, can we use these for prediction? Well, if we look here, deviance explained is a measure of, of model performance that's similar to an R squared value. And you see here that for the drift gill net fishery, for the full time series, the deviance explained is almost 59%. For the albacore troll, it's almost 66%. This is pretty impressive. And this gives us uh, uh, you know, some confidence that these can be used for management. Similarly, the correlations between the predictive values and the uh, actual observed values are high. I also included false positive and false negative error rates. And these were upon request from a reviewer of this manuscript. And what these are telling you is basically how often are you likely to, with the false positive, say that there's going to be fishing effort somewhere when really there isn't going to be any fishing effort there. Or ver like vice versa, how often are you going to say there isn't fishing effort somewhere when there actually is fishing effort here? And from a conservation perspective, 
this false negative is the one that you really want to worry about, right? You don't want to predict that there's not going to be fishing effort somewhere when there actually would be fishing effort there. And if you look, see how low these error rates are, that's really encouraging. Okay, but that's great for predicting the past. How well can we predict the future? And what we did here is, again, we looked three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months into the future. And by that, I mean we used predictor variables like northern oscillation index from three months prior to predict the present fishing effort. And what you'll see is that for the drift gillnet fishery, the deviance explained correlation, all these things hardly change. So that means that we can use past data to predict present fishing effort, or as you might infer, we can use present data to predict, fut predict future fishing effort. And this is really encouraging because managers need some time to work with in order to, to make plans and communicate with the fishers themselves. How about for the albacore troll fishery? Similarly, we see that even though in this case, you know, these kind of dynamic variables tend to be more important, we still can make accurate predictions up to a year in advance. Okay, well, do we need a lot of data to do this? So what I have here are correlations between um, the variable importance scores for fishery, uh, for models built with two years of data, three years of data, four years, five years, 10 years, and 20. Of course, with 20 years, that was a full data set. You're gonna have a correlation of one. But as you go back, you see with 10 years of data, you still have a, a good correlation. And this is for the drift gillnet fishery. With five years of data, most of the correlations are pretty good. And then if we look at how well the models are performing, smaller models, we have then again a minimum, so the worst performing model as well as a maximum. And so, you know, with two, three, four years, these models are okay, but not great. But once we get to five or, or more years, these models tend to be performing pretty well. So we don't need a super long time series in order to be able to predict fishing effort accurately, at least for the drift gill net. And similarly for the um, albacore, troll, albacore troll fishery as well. So you might say to yourself, well, a correlation of, you know, 0.65 isn't that great. But remember, the correlation between the predictions and the real data were only 0.66, right? And so this is as good a correlation between the two predicted values as we had between the predicted and the observed. And again, the deviance explained and these other measures of model performance are all relatively high once you get to four or five or more years. Okay, so now let's talk about temporally static versus dynamic predictive variables. Well, as we expected, um, for the more oceanic albacore troll fishery, the static variables were less important than the dynamic variables. For the drift gillnet fishery, it was the opposite, although they're pretty close in importance here. One thing, though, there's several other differences between the data sets. One of them is that, excuse me, you'll remember the drift gillnet data are from 81 to 2001, whereas the albacore troll data are from 91 to 2010. Well, a lot of satellites weren't even in orbit until the 90s. So the amount of satellite data available for the drift gillnet fishery was far less than for the albacore troll fishery. So to ask ourselves, well, is the amount of data that is available for the model to build and to use as predictors influencing the importance of these dynamic variables? And so what we did is we went back and we built BRT models for each individual year with these, um, with these data sets. And we said, okay, well, what is the correlation between the number of records where you had um, actual data for, the, for you know, each of these things, so primary productivity, let's use that as an example. So the full data set for that year might have had 20,000 records, but we might have only had for any given year between 1,000 or 5,000 records that had primary productivity information in them. Well, so is there a correlation between the amount of records that we have primary productivity information in there and how important, the variable important score for primary productivity for that given year? So we went back and we said, is that the case? And if it is, that's telling us that you know, these variables might be important, but they're not getting incorporated. Indeed, if you look here, there was a strong correlation for all of the albacore troll variables and for a lot of the variables in the drift gillnet. So this is telling us that had we had more of these data available for modeling the drift gillnet fishery, the relative importance of static and dynamic variables would have probably shifted 
in favor of the dynamic variables. And so, you know, obviously we're dealing with data from 20 years ago. Moving forward, that's telling us that these kind of dynamic variables are going to be that much more important because they'll be much more available moving, on, mo moving forward into the future because the satellites are now up in orbit. Okay, so let's summarize this portion of the talk. We've shown that it's possible to model fishing effort effectively, and it's possible to forecast into the future accurately. That you don't need a lot of data, a short time series of data will suffice, and that dynamic variables are important predictors. So what does this mean? Well, this is hopefully a, a, an advancement of bycatching fishing effort co-occurrence co method. It shows that you know, we can do this in a dynamic setting looking forward rather than just using data from the past looking backwards or static data. We don't need a lot of data to do it. At least we don't need a lot of years. It helps to have a lot of data within a given year. You know, we can do this accurately. And this is applicable to a range of fisheries, right? I just showed that it works for a drift gill net fishery and for a troll fishery, operating at two very different spatial scales in two very different environments. And something to keep in mind is this method might even outperform the retrospective approaches, those static bycatch maps, when observer data are limited or if we're dealing with fisheries or bycatch species that are very dynamic in their behavior. Okay, so just pause here for a moment. So we've just focused on the fishery. Well, that's all well and good, but we also need to be able to predict the behavior of the species that we're concerned about. In this case, the leatherback sea turtle here. And so the next question is, how well can we model the uh, distribution and abundance of leatherbacks in the California current? And then can we use that data to assess overlap with the drift gillnet fishery? So the, um, this is a project that's being led by Tomo with uh, Scott uh, helping out quite a quite bit, and I'm, I'm lending my experience with the BRTs. And then Dave Foley, uh, if you all don't know him, he's, he's been a, a great help with, uh, with the ideas and just with his knowledge of the, the satellite ocean, oceanic remotely sensed data. Okay, so I won't bore you with the methods. Again, if we apply the, the BRTs to this and we look at variable importance, for the um, leatherbacks, it turns out that sea surface temperature is the most important, followed by depth, latitude, then day of year, and eddy kinetic energy. So again, they seem to be following dynamic oceanic features, sea surface temperature, day of year, I mean eddy kinetic energy, and then day of year is also something that's changing over time. And so we can't have static maps to describe the distribution of the leatherbacks. Well, what, what is the importance of these data? So this is, again, partial dependence plots. And these, these ones are not smooth, so they're going to be a little choppier. But if we look at sea surface temperature, we see a general increase in um, you know, the likelihood of, of occurring of um, leatherbacks with increasing temperature. Definitely with decreasing depth, we have um, greater likelihood of encountering sea turtles. Um, also, they're more abundant with increasing latitude. Uh, they tend to be most abundant kind of in the later part of the year. And then this one is eddy kinetic energy, a little bit of variability down here. Generally with, with um, lower, lower values, you have greater abundance. And then finally with longitude, uh, this longitude and latitude are correlated, so it's not surprising um, that the abundance increases with increasing longitude. How well are these models performing? Well, the deviance explained is uh, 0.6, so it's comparable to the models we've built to the fisheries. And the mean correlation is 0.77, so even better than the models we built with the fisheries. And this is really encouraging because, uh, you know, it's, it's, we have a lot less data on leatherbacks than we do of the fisheries. And these models were built with weekly data rather than monthly. And so it's just the data sets themselves are much sparser. And so it's really exciting to be able to get these kinds of relationships at uh, much shorter time scales. And so what this allows us to do is to predict the distribution of leatherbacks. Now this distribution is going to be spatiotemporally dynamic due to the importance of those variables I mentioned earlier. And so this map here is, is not just a static map. This is a map for a particular time of year given certain oceanic conditions. 
But the nice thing is that these predictions align well with the known biology of leatherbacks in the California Kern. Again, you know, statistics will tell you a lot, but they won't, they won't give you the common sense of just, you know, looking at a map and telling you, does that, does that match what I think I know about this species? Okay, so we can use these sorts of maps, overlay them with the, the predictions of the fishing efforts to get overlap with fisheries. And unfortunately, we haven't gotten to this just yet. I would love to show you some results, but um, they are forthcoming very shortly. And if you want to see them, you can bug Tomo in the next month or so. We should have some results. Or you can always email me. My email's on the, um, on the cover slide here. Okay, so of course, we're here at Moss Landing and Marine Lab. Um, you know, and boosted regression trees are great for dealing with um, marine systems especially because the things about missing data and so on are particularly common to marine systems. But boosted regression trees can be applied to all sorts of different systems. And I'm going to talk briefly now about some work that my um, collaborators at National Audubon Society did right before I got there. And it just so happens that they were using boosted regression trees to predict grassland bird species range shifts due to climate change. So again, this is something dynamic, right? We know that these species are tracking certain climate variables. and we if the climate's going to change, how's the distribution of the species going to be affected? Well, this is another great use for BRTs. To give you an idea of what they did, so I'm just talking about the grassland birds here, but they actually did this for all 500 some odd species of birds in North America. I mean, can you imagine building 500 large statistical models and fitting them and you know, checking all the assumptions and all that stuff? in a year's time and, and having quality uh, predictions that can be used for management purposes come out of it. It's really a daunting task and that's why BRTs are so great is because they are really very user friendly. They do have their limitations, but they, they are, um, they're a great tool. So here is the um, a species example just to give you an idea again of what they did and then I'll talk about the co all the grassland birds as a whole. Here we have the chestnut colored long spur. And here's its summer distribution based on the climate, bioclimatic envelope. And here's its winter distribution. These are the current predictions based on current sightings. So this, this isn't the actual prediction. This is the output from the boosted regression tree model. It's saying this is where you're going to find the birds. Okay, well, what happens as conditions change? So here along the x axis now, we have, again, we have the summer versus the winter. We have 2020, 2050, 2080. So this is over time, and then we have different climate change scenarios. So A2 is kind of the, the largest emissions, greatest climate change scenario. B2 is the uh, greatest uh, curtailment of emissions, the, the least climate change scenario, and A1B is sort of intermediate between them. And so we, what we can say here is this light orange color here is uh, the current distribution. The gray color is a predicted future distribution, and this darker color in between is the overlap between the current and the future. So you see that as we go from 2020 to 2050 to 2080, the overlap between the current and the future distribution declines. Additionally, just the future just distribution in general also declines for this particular species. And of course, this is the worst case scenario. Well, maybe not the worst case scenario, but the, one, of the worst, one of the worst case scenarios. So this is for summer. In the winter, though, things, the overlap shifts quite a bit again, but the actual uh, distribution of the species doesn't contract. And that makes sense because in the winter, conditions might actually be more favorable for a lot of grassland birds because it's not going to be as cold, right? Okay, so this is for the uh, chestnut colored long spur. And since there are all these different models, what they did is they built consensus uh, models based on predictions all across all emission scenarios. And so here we see here, basically, this dark blue is showing the areas that are currently part of their distribution and will likely remain part of their distribution into the future 100 years, well, I guess uh, 70, 68 years from now, 67 years from now. Again, for the summer and for the winter. So anything that's kind of lighter white up to pink in color means, you know, that's, that's going to be lost. It, that's not going to overlap anymore. So things don't look too good at least for the summer distribution of this species. Well, is this species unique, or is this going to happen to a whole host of grassland bird species? 
Well, here's our current richness patterns. So what this was done is, so I just showed you one species. They did this for all the different grassland birds, and then they just overlaid those distributions to get at the, the richness patterns here. So wherever you, know, you had two species in the same grid cell, that would add to the species richness in that grid cell. So we had the highest grassland bird species richness up here in Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan. Um, in the, in the winter, summer and in the winter down here in Arizona, Texas, and so on. Okay, well, what happens as uh, the conditions change? Well, we go from, again, 2020, 2050, 2080, you see the richness overall declines and it tends to shift north, not surprisingly. Same thing in the winter, we generally have a, a decline in richness and that richness again shifts north. So there's, there's a lot of change going. And if we go for a consensus of predictions across now all species and all emission scenarios, we see that things are changing a lot for these species. And um, you know, there needs to be uh, very, I guess management needs to be really focused on these core areas, what they call refugia, if they hope to get some sort of persistence of some of these grassland birds between now and the future. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, National Research Council post postdoctoral program that funded a lot of this research, as well as the um, Highly Migratory Species Group and the Marine Turtle Ecology and Assessment Program at Southwest Fisheries, the fishers themselves who provided these data. US and, fishers, fish, US Fish and Wildlife Service funded the, um, the climate change bird work that I talked about, and then the Lenfest Ocean Program as well. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Do you have available dynamics at this point to kind of mirror the, the patterns? Did you try that at all? We tried it a little bit. Um, that was kind of at the beginning when we were exploring it more. And yeah, so there is these uh, variables there. Like I said, the, you don't have to worry about collinearity. A lot of these variables are related to each other. And so you can drop, for example, off the west coast here, latitude and longitude, you know, they're fairly tightly correlated. So you can often drop one and the other, you know, will pick up a lot of the slack. So when we did that, we still could get fairly good predict predictions, but they weren't as good. And since our focus for this particular project was on getting the best predictions possible, we didn't. But yeah, uh, um, they I certainly. Think it's a way of evaluating the relative um, quality of the dynamics and status. Yeah. Only status or any dynamics that you have. And I think it would be a fair comparison if you had full data sets for both. But because we, as I showed, like the amount of data you had, so it's not a complete. It, I think it would be a great exercise if you had that. Yeah. Yes? I had a question. I was on the Fisheries Committee of Ocean Monitoring Group, and I asked some folks who were doing the work on the Ocean Monitoring Group to look at it. And it seemed to me that it was just largely to look at the data that had been put together. We haven't tried that, but that's actually a great point. That might be something that we try with this overlap approach coming up. So, yeah. I, I, it would be nice to see because, you know, cross-validation, as I mentioned, is a great way. It's, it's much more reasonable representation of what's going to happen. One thing I, I want to mention is we cross-validated across years. And so basically we, we didn't use the same year's data to predict observations in that year. We would drop a year of data and then use other years to predict into that year. So ideally, our models are already fairly robust to that sort of interannual variability. But you never know until you actually fit them to brand new data.
Yeah. We we didn't try that. That's definitely something that we're interested in, in the sense of you know bringing in more of the socioeconomic, and and like policy, um, variables, because yeah, I mean we're getting pretty good predictions just based on this, but uh, you know for example distance nearest port is probably, you know to some degree explaining just like well you know how expensive is fuel, how far are they willing to travel to go fishing, things like that. So. Again, there's some overlap between these variables, but it'd be nice to have the actual drivers rather than just the correlates of them. Yeah, or like the fishery for why did you go to the closure area of the shore as opposed to Mount Kilimanjaro? Yeah. Why did Mount Kilimanjaro go to the closure area of the <laughs> Yeah, uh, so with that kind of data, if you actually have the spatial data, you can do that. But some of the other socioeconomic data are just harder to obtain, of course, which is one of the challenges. Thank you.